Okay, sorry for a little bit of a late start. Um, any questions before we get into things for today? It's already February, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, I'm not sure if I want this year to go faster or slower, you know? Okay, so a couple of things logistically. Uh, worksheet two, I made it through tonight. I, I know some people had a bit of issues submitting, so I just extended it to tonight um, just to make sure everyone has a chance to get that in. Worksheet three is gonna be due this Friday, worksheet four, maybe, if we get through it. Um, I'm not sure if we're gonna get to it today or mm, next time or when. Um, as far as, just to clarify for the worksheets, um, I'm not like checking for plagiarism or anything like that. Um, so, feel free to collaborate with people who are near you. Um, in fact, if that's encouraged. And I'll talk a little bit more about project one probably today as well. I'll, it's available on the, on the website. You can go to projects and then go to the starter code. You might by the end of today not have all of the information that you need for it. Um, and that's that's fine, but I just wanted to make it available so you can take a look at it and start getting familiar with that. Um, okay, any other, okay, question here for the worksheet is worksheet five to this. Oh dear. Okay, well, that was fun. For the worksheet, is worksheet five due this week? Um, the cash introduction one, maybe. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll have to see. Uh, if we get through it today and on, um, so worksheet four doesn't exist. I'm named, okay, so sorry for the worksheet naming convention. I named the worksheet after the lecture they're corresponding to. Um, do we have to submit the actual worksheet or is it okay if we do it on a separate piece of paper? It's okay if you do it on a separate piece of paper. You just have to match the number of pages that the worksheet has. So you might have to add a blank page and that's totally fine. I don't, I don't really care. The, the, the reason, um, the reason for, for doing it the way, um, that I have it where, where you have to submit the same number of pages is mainly for your own sake, for, for the majority of people who are just submitting the worksheet itself. Because then you don't have to mark, otherwise you'd like have to mark where you answer stuff and that sounds really annoying. Okay, um, well, that was fun. I think um, today's the first, so my next OS uh, auto, <laughs> upgrade script went and uh, it has auto reboot. So I will turn that off because that's kind of funny. Um, all right, give me a second here to rejoin the Zoom. Sorry about that. Okay, attempt number two. Okay, um, just a very 
quick recap since it's been a few few days. Um, we're talking about Amdahl's law. Uh, this is a equation which bounds how much speed up we can get if we target x of uh, a program. So if we part target some some fraction x of our program, Amdahl's law gives us the maximum total speed up that we can expect. Um, okay. Now, um, we were we did a bunch of um, problems on this last time, and we got to a problem. Um, where we have two different optimizations. Um, so we have one optimization, our cache, which is going to speed up 80% of our memory oper operations by a factor of four. And we have another widget, which is L2 cache, which speeds up the uh, half of the remaining memory operations by a factor of two. Now, we cannot just uh, naively go and, and start um, calculating the speed ups and then combining them with multiplication. That's not going to work. Uh, anybody remember, remember why? The size changes as you go. The size changes as you go, exactly. Um, so. Here it is in pictures. You can see that after we do apply the first optimization, the total time changes. So the percentage of the total execution that is taken up by L2 cache that can be optimized by the L2 cache actually increases. And um, so we, we developed this, this law for multiple optimizations. Um, okay, so so we'll, just to recap, we have n disjoint optimizations. This disjoint thing is important. Um, the optimizations can't apply to the same bits of the program. We'll talk in a minute about how to deal with having non-disjoint optimizations. Um, but let's just say we have so we have I optimizations, or um, I guess this should be N, A. Eh? Uh, I could probably change that. Um, anyway, these terms here correspond to the speed ups we're going to get from each of those optimizations. And then this term in the parentheses is just all the rest of the stuff that hasn't been optimized by any of the optimizations, which leads us to back to this problem, except for this time we have the tools that we need to actually solve it. So I'll give you a, a couple minutes. This is the fourth problem on the worksheet.
So um, the first the first thing is we need to calculate um, x sub one and x sub two because there's two optimizations. The speed ups are kind of already given, right? So we, we have a factor of four and a factor of two. So four and two are going to be our speed ups. We need to calculate x. So let me just go ahead and so this is for L1 cache, L2 cache. Uh, speed up here is just four. So what did you get, guys get for X for the L1? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll put up the equation. Point two four. Yeah, that sounds right. Oh crap, where'd it go? I'll put it there, I guess. Yeah, so 0.24 is the correct answer here. Um, so where do we get that? Well, memory operations are 30% of the entire uh, program. So we automatically get 0.3 and then of those, it says that we can optimize 80%. So that's a 0.8. And that's 0.24. Okay, what about L2? X for L2. 0 0.03. How did you get that? Okay, cool. And how did you guys get that? So this is one half of remaining right there. Um, yeah, exactly. Yes, question. How would that factor in? So what we're doing here is we're calculating X for L2 cache in terms of the entire program. So instead of, um, oh shoot, I guess that's here. Um, uh, we're, we're calculating it in terms of this entire total instead of according to this like truncated one. It's kind of the idea. Um, the other important factor is that we're factoring it into our equation um, because we're subtracting it out of the stuff that doesn't get optimized. Okay. Right, right. Um, so, L2 doesn't change how much real, like actual instructions it's optimizing, just the percentage related to all the other ones changes. Exactly. Okay, and then we just plug it in. And um, uh, what, what answers did you guys get? Where did you get the point one? Okay, so there's, there's a few ways of doing this. Um, maybe I can expand this out. Um, another way of, of doing this is one minus 0 0.8. So this is the remaining memory operations. And then half of those. 
which is going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.01, or 0 0.1, sorry. Um, so this term is just saying uh, remaining memory operations. And then this is half of them get optimized. And yeah, so when we plug it in, um, 1.242 sounds right. OK. Mm, any other questions? So I mentioned that this doesn't handle, uh, this only handles disjoint optimization. So the optimizations have to apply to different parts of the program. Does anybody have an idea of how we could extend this so that it would work with overlapping optimizations? Without looking at the next slide. Yeah. Because, so, okay, that's a great question. So the question is why is it not um, one minus point three here? And the reason. is that uh, not all of the 0.3 gets optimized. So not all, like there's going, there's, uh, there's still gonna be memory operations that kind of slip through the cracks, if you will. If we go back to the problem, um, so 80% aren't gonna be affected by the first one. And then of the, um, of, of that 20% remaining, half of them aren't going to be affected. So we actually have a 0.03% of the entire program that isn't going to be affected by all of this, or 10% of the memory operation. Great question. Yeah, definitely uh, important to keep that uh, keep that in mind. And these terms here are related to how like how much gets optimized. Um, so it's accounting for everything that doesn't get optimized. And it's, you know, the 0.7 plus then the 0.03 that, that, uh, that gets left alone by both of these. Okay. Um, other questions?
Um, so a suggestion was to multiply items uh, that impact each other and then how they're related. Yeah, so it's going to be kind of difficult still. Um, the, the way to handle multiple uh, optimizations that are overlapping is we basically just treat the overlap as a separate portion of the execution, and then we measure its speed up accordingly. Um, so it's a, a bit annoying, but it's kind of the, the way we have to go. So for example, let's say we have two overlapping optimizations, um, x1 and x2, and they overlap. We'll split up the program into x1 only and x2 only. So these are the parts of the program that only get affected by x1 and only get affected by x2. And then we have a separate term for their overlap which is x1 and 2. Um, and likewise, for the, for the subtraction over here, we do x1 and x2 uh, alone, and then the overlap. Now, it's kind of hard to actually compute this. So um, you can estimate that. Uh, S1 and 2 is equal to S1 only times S2 only. But that's that's just an estimate. It's not the real value may be different. Okay. Questions. Yeah. You, you can estimate it or you can do it empirically. Yeah. Computers are so complicated, this becomes an inexact science, unless you are really, really familiar with how everything works. Did you just answer a question about how to find uh, yeah, X sorry. 1 and 2? Mm -hmm. The question was how to find S1 and 2. And yeah. Estimating is kind of estimating or, or finding it empirically. Um, or or just pretending it doesn't exist. That's probably not a good idea, but you know. Okay. And what about the <laughs> X values? Uh, are we to assume we'd be given those or are those values we need to find for ourselves as well? What about the X values? Um, you can assume they'll be given. Okay, um, give me one second to adjust my mic. Okay, um, let's move on. What we're gonna do now uh, is a bit of review of hopefully some stuff that you've seen before so I don't really blame you if you've kind of forgotten. We're going to talk about MIPS, um, kind of ISAs, and, uh, and how processors work at a, at a very high level, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, because it's going to be necessary for you know, the entire rest of the class to have this baseline understanding. Okay, so what is a CPU? All of our computers these days are stored program computers. We talked kind of a little bit about this uh, first or second day of class. All our program itself is data, it's stored in memory, um, and it is just a series of bits, just like any other data. Um, and it is, Consistent consists of a, a series of just individual discrete instructions. Uh, we'll talk about what that means in just a second. And we have this program counter, 
which controls execution. So it points to the place in memory where the instruction that we want to execute next is, or the current instruction. Um, and then it, it just advances uh, through the program. So let's see an example. Our program counter, let's just say it points here to begin with. Then that's an add unsigned operation. Now it goes to the next instruction, which is load or something. I don't know. I, I always forget all these. Um, and then it just keeps going through our program. So what are these instructions? The instructions that are available are defined by the instruction set architecture or ISA. Um, and the ISA is just the, the set of instructions that the computer knows how to execute. Um, and every program that is compiled for that given architecture is a combination of those instructions. Um, ISAs are an abstraction. Uh, I think we, I briefly touched on this lecture two, I think, that um, for a while, there were many, many different lines of computers with all sorts of different sets of instructions. And it was really, really difficult to cross the pile. Um, but by introducing this ISA, we were, we were able to abstract the computing functionality away from the actual implementation. So the ISA defines some set of operations, defines some semantics, it defines rules. So if you're taking PL, you know, very similar to that, except like way lower level. And um, then the software agrees to follow these rules and, you know, use those instructions. But the hardware can do whatever it wants um, to implement this. You could implement the ISA directly in hardware, which is what a CPU does generally. You could add a software layer, like a virtual machine to, to emulate your ISA. You could have a trained monkey do it with pen and paper. Um, though I'm pretty sure you'd have a lot of uh, it, computing errors with this. And you could also use a software simulator, BIM, for example. If, I'm sure you remember if you took comp work here, having to deal with that. Um, and in fact, this has come in handy for Intel because they I don't think they even really implement x86 anymore. They implement a, a risk underneath and then they transpile the x86 instructions to risk instructions because it's just too much work. Okay. So let's talk about MIPS. Um, MIPS is very simple. It's elegant, easy to implement. There's not that many instructions. Um, there's a lot of thought put into it. Um, it's designed for, it's a risk. So it's, it's, not, it's, very mo it's fairly modern. I mean, all things considered in computer architecture. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of good things about it. Um, X86, unfortunately, is the one that is dominant these days and has been for decades and probably will continue to be for decades. Um, though I am on risk five train, so hopefully they, they get their act together. Um, anyway, x86 is ugly, it's messy, it's really very, it's very difficult to implement. Like I said, like, uh, I don't even think that Intel really implements the full thing anymore. I think they might have a, a translation layer. It was designed in the 70s, um, and it's and it's uh, it's the inheritor of many many unfortunate designs of ISAs. But unfortunately, we have to you will have to deal with it if you go into uh, uh, you know computer engineering or computer architecture. 
But we're going to stay with MIP because I don't want to have to figure out x86. Um, and the concepts still apply, right? Like, you know, memory is still going to behave very similarly uh, from, from one ISA to another. Um, we just might have more annoying instructions to, to deal with it in x86 versus MIP. So we're, we're going to use a simpler one. OK, so let's talk about the basics of MIPS. So our instructions are four bytes, or one word, uh, which is 32 bits. Everything is byte aligned. So um, all of our uh, addresses are going to start at addresses that are a multiple of four. So for example, OX0000 or OX0004, et cetera. Um, our instructions are going to operate on memory and registers. And um, we have different types, basically, uh, different, different sizes um, that, we, that we care about. We have bytes, which are just eight bits. Half words, which are 16 bits. And words, which are 32 bits. And these are also aligned. Uh, a court on on eight, sixteen, and thirty-two, uh, respectively. Um, so we we denote stuff like memory like this. We have a M, and then our address. This is a byte address uh, that we care about, and that's how we're going to denote memory. And we have registers. There's 32 of them. They're, uh, all of them are, are four bytes, which you'll notice there's a lot of 32, you know, 32 bits, 32 bits. Registers are 32 bits. And um, they're all stored in this register file. And we're going to denote any register um, like R with the brackets and then the, the number of the register. OK. So that's the terminology. So here's here's just some examples. Uh, say that we have some some address, some byte address here, next byte address, next byte address, as you can see. Um, and this contains data a a. 1, 5, 1, 3, et cetera. Um, memory is byte addressable, but then our half words and our words are going to be aligned. Uh, so we can't access, for example, the word at 0, 0, uh, 0, 001. We can only access the, word, the half word starting at 0, 0, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 0, 002. And each one of these will have the corresponding data AA15, which is just a combination you know, the, of these two. Um, and then two will have the next half word, the next two bytes. Words, likewise, are going to be aligned. So we can't access the, a word starting at like 0003. We have to only look at the address at 0, 4, 8, et cetera. Okay, any questions so far? So let's talk about this register file. All the registers are the same, except for the zero one. Um, whenever you need to use a register, you can use any of them, but by convention, um, there are specific ones that you're supposed to use for specific things, um, like argument passing, temporary uh, variables, values. Um, and the way that you use these registers is part of the ISA. 
Um, so you can kind of see here, um, registers two and three are return values, four through seven are arguments, eight through 15 are temporary variables or uh, temporary registers, saved temporaries, more temporaries because you know we can't put them together right um some stuff for the os um and then just some other pointers for um uh um you know global pointer stack pointer frame pointer return address stuff like that um the zero register is kind of special it's always zero um and writes to it don't do anything. This is useful because a lot of things we need to compare to zero to see if they're true or false. Okay. So let's talk about our type arithmetic instructions. So uh, R type instructions encode operations of the form a equals b op c okay so some of the operations that it could be is plus minus binary left shift and or etc and generally we write write them kind of you know like this if we if you want um so R and then RD equals R of RS and op R of RT. So what is RD, RS, and RT? Well, those come from up here. These are just which register we're using for, for this operation. Um, RD is the destination. RS is I don't remember why it's S and T. I don't think it really matters. Um, and conveniently, each one of these uh, parts are five bits, which is exactly how many we need to index into 32 registers. Um, To determine which one of these operations we need to do, we look at the opcode, which is the first six uh, bits of, of this instruction. And our shift amount, um, this is for shift operation, uh, is, is stored over here. Um, and then, oh yeah, so this is the actual like, this is what the, the actual arithmetic operation to do. Question. Source, target, destination. Okay. There you go. Um, so yeah, some examples. We might have add uh, T1, uh, T0, T1, T2. This would correspond to from the previous slide, T0 is, is eight, you know, T1 is nine, T2 is 10. And this is going to add the values of register nine to register 10 and put it in register eight. That's what this instruction does. Um, and the opcode here would be zero. Uh, and our, our actual function is OX20 which is add. Um, here's another one, shift left. Again, I don't remember, like, I, it's not too important to remember the actual, like, names. I'll, I'll pretty much give you the semantics for any of these. Um, but this is a, a, a binary, um, left shift, so we're putting it in, into register four and taking register 16 binary left shift by four and then putting it into register four. Okay.
questions? What's the di uh, difference between MIPS and MAPS or MARS? Oh, MARS, I think it's an emulator, right? Yeah. So Mars is an emulator for MIPS. Will we be using Mars? No. Yeah, you've written enough MIPS in Complar. This is mainly just to make sure we're all on the same page and understand some of the some of the things that we're working with. What are some of the opcode types? Well, so so this is one. Uh, this is the um, our our arithmetic operations are opcode zero. Um, we'll have other opcodes for stuff like um, uh, these I type instructions and and for our branch instructions. But we'll get to those in a minute. So. We also have some R type control instructions. Um, and these basically um, are allowing us to do branches and such, um, or, you know, not, not branches, uh, jumping from, from one bit of uh, code to another. Um, so, for example, jump register is going to set our program counter to whatever the value in that register is. So, if we say jr to t2, it's telling us to change the program counter to whatever is in register 10. Um, and this particular instruction has the, the funct of OX8. And so there's, there's other stuff like jump and link register. Um, which I don't remember what it does. Again, I don't think it's extremely insightful. Um, okay. I type instructions. So I type instructions or I, I type arithmetic instructions are named this because it's a uh, immediate that's what the i comes from um, and they're of this form a equals b off and then some number or our immediate so the op again is similar to the the previous r type instruction um, but um, here it's instead of using this funct as the definition for what operations do we just use the op code and we have an integer constant as our 16 last bits of the instruction. This also has a source and target, kind of like the, the uh, um, R-type instructions. And here's an example. So we have an add immediate um, where we take um, the value of T1, add negative 42, and then place that into R8, and that's what this instruction would encode. And that is the opcode OX8, um, or immediate would be um, uh, with zero and then 842 would be oring the value of R0, which is just zero, with 42, and that goes into R4. 
this is a way of, for example, loading a constant value into our T0 register. OK. Now, it's really important that we have if statements, or else it's not going to be any at all useful. It's not going to be turn complete. So um, we have I type branch instructions as as uh, something that we can can do. And basically, these um, are going to set the program counter uh, to something depending on uh, the, the result of the operation between um, these two RD and RS um, registers, or RS, RT. OK, so here an example of this would be um, like branch if it's uh, branch is equal. Um, and then we have two registers, T0 T and T1. If they're equal to one another, then we're going to change our program counter to the current PC plus four and then plus four times negative 42. We'll talk about that in just a second, but that's the idea. We're allowing our, our program counter to move backwards and forwards by some amount. Um, generally, RS and RT are the two registers that need to be compared. Sometimes, though, the RT specifies a branch type. And then the immediate, the 16 bits at the end, this is going to be the signed offset um, of the target to the branch. Um, so you can only jump, though, 32K instructions because of this, right? Um, because that's how, how many you can encode in 16 bits. And even if you wrote assembly, you probably would never have to actually use that because you can just use labels and then the assembler, you know, uh, would be able to uh, figure it out for you. Uh, here's another one, B greater than or equal to zero. Here's one that um, uh, RT doesn't specify a register um, because there's nothing to compare it to. It's, uh, we're just always comparing to zero. And so if it, if uh, register eight is greater than or equal to zero, then we update the program counter to PC plus four and then plus our, our offset times four. Um, the reason for having this PC plus four is so that you can just always do this in hardware. You can always just set at the very end of your of doing an instruction, you can always increase PC by four. And that uh, you just have to account for that when you're doing these computations for how far to jump. OK. Now, it's important that we are also able to load and store from memory. And this is where our I-type memory instructions come in. So uh, we're going to use both um, RS and RT um, to, to uh, denote either the spot in memory where we want to start to get data from or the, the destination where we want to to put the data. So for example, um, a store instruction, we were indexing into the memory at our RS uh, register at RS value. So let's just say this is memory value zero. 
And then we have an immediate, and then we have R of RT. So we're storing whatever's in register RT into our memory at this index. The immediate is useful because then you can just compute, for example, like the, the beginning of your array and then increment your immediate by some value if you would like. Um, and here's, here's an example of that in action. So we're storing, um, this is our, uh, uh, our T value. This one's our immediate, and then this one's the um, RS. So this is just storing this value into memory. Loading is the converse. We're loading from memory into a register. Um, and then there's different opcodes for different types of loads and stores. We can load by byte, half word, or word. And um, uh, there's um, w when we load something that's less than a word, we can um, uh, use the sign to determine how it gets how the rest of the register gets filled up, whether it's all zeros or if we sign extend the value. And yeah, the immediate is is useful for stuff like either uh, struct accesses or, or other other things where you know at compile time how far away from a reference your data will be. Okay, um, let's see. Last one, J type instructions. So these are pure jumps. Um, they jump from um, PC plus four and then we take the, the top most significant bits, then the address that's given, and then two zeros at the end. The reason for this is because it's always going to be the zeros, because it is uh, word aligned or byte aligned. I think it's word aligned. Um, yeah, because it's instructions, because that's, that's going to be uh, by word. And so the idea here is that the address is going to replace most of our program counter. Uh, we're going to keep the, the top most significant bits, like I mentioned, and the you know the last last two bits don't matter, um, but everything else is going to be replaced. Um, yeah, there's also other instructions that this encodes interrupts, breaks, syscalls, but we aren't going to really care too much about them. All right, bit of a whirlwind, but sorry if I incorrectly said any of these, it's been a while. And like I said, it's not like, like super critical that you know the intricacies, but you do need to know like kind of the, the idea of these different instructions um, and be able to at least look at an instruction, have an idea of what it's doing. Okay. Questions. Okay, so let's just review uh, a bit about how you get from a program, let's just say a C program, to actual bits that can be executed. Um, so 
obviously the weakest link here, probably this, your brain, spine. Um, actually, maybe it's your fingers. It's probably actually the case. Uh, and then we, you know, you write a programming language, it gets compiled to assembly, then your assembler that will um, turn that into machine code, then that gets linked, and then we get an executable like a .exe or a um, ELF file if you're on Linux. I don't know what the Mac OS one is, but that's the general idea. Um, the, the, top, the top stuff, that's gonna be architecture independent. So this is the, you know, when we talk about high level, you should basically be thinking architecture independent. Like C is a high level language. People think it's low level, it's not. There's a good article refuting that. Yeah. Let's ignore interpreted languages. Okay. Because interpreted languages are just compiled languages that have another language on top. <laughs> like at some point you have to have a compiled language. Um, if even if you are using an interpreter. Um, great question though. Yeah, like you, uh, another a way of thinking about um, interpreted languages is that, that it's kind of like another kind of branch over here is another abstraction layer. I like hating on interpreted languages and then I go home and write Python. So there's that. Okay, so um, so here's a here's a program. This counts the number ones in the binary representation of I. Um, uh, basically, it's going to do this by by doing a bunch of uh, ands compare uh, to compare um, each one of the uh, each one of the bits in our in our integer. So again, this is this is just an example. Um, don't worry a ton about the implementation. But the compiler, if you've taken compilers or Maybe if you've taken PL, you will have you will have dealt with an abstract syntax tree um, in maybe some or uh, some more um, depth, depending on which class. But eventually, you're going to basically take this program and turn it into an abstract syntax tree representing the computation that needs to be performed, and then. Uh, the compiler will also convert this to a control flow graph. The control flow graph, um, so this, this abstract syntax tree is, is um, it's not great. You could interpret this or, you know, compile it just kind of directly and you'd get a program that would potentially work. But uh, you really need to, to get this control flow graph because then you can do a bunch of optimizations on this graph. Um, this graph is, you know, you, could, you can do a lot of heuristics on here and this is, this is where compilers do most of their work is optimizing this graph. Um, and from that control flow graph, then you, you know, can add stuff like the actual branches to to do the correct things like return and um, uh, um, you know this is an, a branch here so we have to have a two couple branches in this program um, and yeah so this is the idea this is the this is the main process down to the assembly. And then from assembly, then you'll have to actually convert that into binary, shove that into a, uh, a file and call it a day. Okay.
Um, any any questions? Um, so top reasons to use assembly code. If you're writing a compiler, you maybe don't have a choice. So that would be a good reason to use assembly because you probably don't want to write machine code. Uh, another reason, maybe you want to understand what the machine is doing. This is maybe a, a good, good reason. Assembly code may be faster. If you're good, if you're bad, then the compiler is going to be better than you. And honestly, the compiler is almost always going to be better than you these days. Or maybe the real reason you just want to look cool. Honestly, the pain is too much for me. I just avoid it. Question, yeah. If you want to look cool, you can write your assembly in C. Correct. Yeah, you can just put your inline assembly in, and then and then don't comment it, and then just yell at the next person for not understanding it. Like, well, how can you not understand this? I like that. Yeah. Small embedded processors. That's probably another place where you might need to be writing assembly. But honestly, try and bootstrap a C compiler and <laughs> like. The thing is, like these days, even even small embedded stuff, you can run, you can get, you can compile a C program, you can get GCC running on your toaster. So, yeah, I mean that's totally valid, but just get GCC. I swear, GCC you can compile to anything. Okay. Um, any other comments, questions? So we aren't obviously going to get through this, but we'll, we'll get started. Um, this is going to be a, a fairly major topic we're going to spend probably a few weeks just talking about cache. But before we get to cache, we have to talk about the entire memory hierarchy uh, in general. Why do we even need this? So uh, there's kind of a problem. Um, there's, there's this discrepancy that has been emerging and continues to emerge where our processors are way faster than memory. So, you know, they're they're going they're both getting better. But processors are getting better at a much faster rate um, than memory. And so like in 1980, for example, you don't really need a cache. You know, your memory is fast enough to keep up with your processor. But by the time you get here, you know, you have a fairly large discrepancy, you know, an order of magnitude or so you're going to need maybe two orders orders of magnitude even um, and by this time we have we have multi multi level caches um, and this trend is continued um, most processors these days have three three levels of cache um, so here's here's just an a diagram of, of like how bad it can actually be. So let's just say that um, we're we're trying to equate like distances to how far, how fast we can get um, get some data. So let's just say that we have one. This is our standard uh, for for registers, um, and that maybe is equivalent to like something coming out of my head. I'm pretty dumb, so it's going to take me a minute. So let's just assume that'll that'll take a minute. Okay. Now, we might have if we have the uh, the data on onboard cache, maybe it'll take two minutes, and this would be equivalent to it being in this room. You know, maybe it's somewhere on one of your pieces of paper, 
And I just ask each one of you, hey, do you have this value? And you tell me what it is. Maybe it takes a little while to coordinate this, um, but, but it's not that slow. Then um, maybe we have uh, onboard cache. So maybe this is L2 or L3 cache. This is going to be, it's somewhere in the building, right? Maybe it's downstairs, maybe it's upstairs. But we could all go and run around the building and get this in a couple minutes, um, maybe 10 minutes. Now, those are, those are our caches. Memory is going to be another order of magnitude slower. It would be like going over to Boulder, for example getting and then you know taking a piece of paper from there and bringing it all the way back and it's probably traffic because you know people are bad at driving at this time of the day especially uh, so one and a half hours now the thing is when we talk about other things in our hierarchy so beyond the memory onto like disk if we have to swap out, for example, um, we're we're looking at many orders of magnitude slower, you know, kind of this, this two years maybe. Um, I'm not sure how we're getting to Pluto in two years, but let's just let's just ignore that. Uh, and then, well, clearly we all use tape, um, but you could replace this with like, I don't know, S3 Glacier. Uh, and, and you're looking at many thousands of years. So again, this what this illustration is is trying to get a, across is like the um, the latency of getting data at a higher, uh, uh, I guess, at lower levels of the memory hierarchy is just going to balloon very, very quickly. Um, many orders of magnitude. So, um, because of that, because there's this this widening gap, we have to we have to have more layers down here to compensate to make it look like there's no gap. And quite frankly, it's pretty amazing that you know there's a lot of work that goes into this because you know programmers like to think that everything's fast when it really isn't. So let's talk about the impact of memory. So if we have M is some percentage of the instructions uh, of our program, um, and we have um, uh, M latency, this is one that's just going to be in cycles. This is the average memory latency. And we have a base CPI, um, CPI base. Uh, and this is our CPI with single cycle data memory. So this is our CPI assuming that memory operations are going to take one cycle. Totally false, but let's just say that. In this case, um, what we can do is we can actually calculate the entire total CPI. It's going to be our base CPI. So assuming that there's only one cycle for memory access, plus M, so this is the percentage of the program that's memory accesses, times the latency of the access. So for example, let's just say we have some really slow memory that's going to take 240 cycles. And um, our CPI base, we're just going to say it's one, all the instructions take one cycle. And we only have 20% memory instructions. Well, now if we calculate CPI total, we're gonna end up, you know, you just plug it in 1.2 and 240, you get 49. It's kind of bad. 49 cycles on average. So our speed up is uh, 1 over 49, which is 0.02. So there's a 98% drop in performance, even though our memory operations were only 0.2 of the program, but that 240 really killed us. And again, this, this goes back to the fact that Amdahl's law doesn't bound slowdown. 
if you have bad memory performance, it can make your entire program arbitrarily slow. So this is why it's important. Um, we need, you know, we want this number to go down. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at um, uh, throughout the next few days. Um, let's see. I think we're going to stop here. Um, I, I want to. I, I guess you probably you, you probably aren't going to want to start on project one, but if you do, you can read the uh, you can read the description um, from that uh, that the project page. And um, if you do read it, here's how I recommend reading this: read everything, starting from the top until you get down to full requirements and then stop reading. Um, <clears throat> the full requirements, this is all just information. If you want to implement this simulation in some other language and not use the starter code, so you can do that, but you will have to make sure that you follow these full requirements. If you use the starter code, you don't have to worry about the full requirements because they're already fulfilled. Um, and there's a lot of stuff down here. So you can ignore that again. Um, and if if you're unfamiliar with C, I've linked here a, a C programming review written by Jack. Um, and this is he uses this in OS as well. Um, and it's a good way if you if you're more familiar with C to kind of get familiar with C. Um, Questions before we you... okay, you're dismissed. I'll stay around for any more questions. <laughs>